Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is artist, musician, and storyteller Isaac Murdoch. Murdoch, who is from Serpent River First Nation, is a traditional knowledge keeper who has committed his life to the preservation of Anishinaabe cultural practices. Perhaps best known for his art, he has also authored books, released an album, and hosts cultural camps. Isaac, uh, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. We're super happy and thrilled to have you. It's been a couple of years I've wanted to get you here. And the fact that you're here in studio is just uh, amazing for us. So thanks for doing the show. Thank you. Uh, let's start with your artwork because I think a, a lot of people would recognize uh, your work. Uh, it's been front and center at a, at a lot of rallies, a lot of actions. Uh, do you feel like art can promote change? I think art is, is something that has been used by our people for thousands and thousands of years to showcase the spirit of who we are. And so when you look at the old pictographs that the Anishinaabek made, the Muznabiyaganan, you'll notice that those pictures that were painted on those rocks are still alive today. They still tell stories today. They still invoke the spirit of who we are today. And I don't think that there's much difference between art and ceremony. Because it's all about spirit and bringing the spirit out of people, you know, for something better. And so I think that art does that so perfect. That is an amazing answer. Um, you know, can, do you have, uh, <laughs> like, examples that, that come to your mind of, you know, seeing art uh, uniting people? Yeah, so for example, at Standing Rock, there was uh, an image that I figured would be good with Thunderbird Woman. And so I had some people, like, were screaming on the phone with me saying, we need Thunderbird Woman because there's going to be these, these big protests coming. And, and I'm like, click. I don't know who you are. Um, I don't even know what you're talking about. And people are like, you got to let us use Thunderbird Woman. And uh, finally I said, yeah. And it was like Clayton Thomas Mueller and, and David Solnit and those guys were like, let us use your art, please. Mm -hmm. And uh, once it did, it just took off. It, it went... It, my art just went global after that. And, you know, I think people, whether they know it or not, have seen your art everywhere. Standing Rock is uh, certainly one of those places. Uh, where has your art turned up? Um, I've had pictures of, like, like, really cool African tribal people holding up my art, you know, in, 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 a, in a, a desert in Africa. I've had them, I've had it show up in, like, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Tibet. Mm -hmm. um, Mongolia, uh, all over Europe and South America and all over the world, you know. And some really cool people have, have tweeted my art, you know, which is kind of neat. You know, like when you see Joaquin Phoenix holding my art, it's like, that's so strange. Yeah. You know, it's like really cool. Yeah, I bet that never gets old. <laughs> um, what yeah. was it like, you know, starting to see your art really going global? Um, surreal, and it kind of still is. Yeah. You know, like my art's a lot more famous than I am. Nobody knows who I am. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you're like, hey, I know that picture. But I'll be like walking down the street, but I don't know that guy. You know, so it's, it's kind of nice because I never really copyrighted my art. And I said, this art is for the people. It's for them to use, to fundraise for their own initiatives for the earth and, and water. And don't even cite me. Don't credit me. Just use it. If you want to make T-shirts and... And, you know, try to make money for your cause, go for it, you mm -hmm. know? And so uh, the art has always been used that way. And, and I think that's how it's gotten to, to travel so far and free. It is surreal. It's, it's like, uh, like, how did that happen, mm -hmm. you know? Do you kind of like that anonymity of, uh, you know, your art being everywhere, but people not knowing who you are? Or would you like some recognition for some of that? I mean, the anonymity or whatever that word is, is kind of disappearing because I was at this place last night and I had all these people coming up to me, talking to me, right? Saying, oh, I just love your art and I love your stories and yada, yada, yada. But it is nice to be able to, to go into a restaurant and everybody's like, has no idea who I am. That's, that feels great. Yeah. What are uh, you know, some of the causes that uh, your work has helped raise money for? Um, mostly environmental. So 
I'm really, really big on trying to at least contribute to having a cleaner environment for the future. So that's the biggest thing. I tell all the environmentalists, use the art. You know, all of the traditionalists, use the art. You know, sell it, make money off of it, make shirts, you know, do whatever you can, make banners, but, but use it. Because, you know, we're in a, a very bad situation with climate change. We're suffering a massive ecological collapse. And so I want my art to be used to, to contribute to make the world better for the future. It's really that simple. Nice. Um, your art, was this something that you've done since you were young? Is something that came to you at a later age? Um, it was something that I did when I was later. My mother was a, a terrific artist when she was alive. She was fantastic. And she did doodles. And so she got, you know, I sort of did doodles too. And so I remember I, I was asked to compliment this one book. And it was Nishinaabe when number two or something. It was this book, a Ojibwe book, right? And they're like, can you do a doodle of Nanabuju? I'm like, yeah. So I did a doodle of Nanabuju and I used to use felt markers and it got put in the book. And then I met Christy Belcourt. And me and Christy, of course, were friends. We were hanging out with each other. And I did an image. And she's like, that's it. And I'm like, I'm not putting that image out at all. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's a really dumb image. She goes, no, that's, that's really good. And so she really encouraged my art. And uh, she, you know, I pretty much became her student, you know, for the first year of learning how to do doodles. Right. You know, so it was really fun to have Christy Lake, who's just a brilliant artist, you know, sit there and, and go through the motions of, of how to, to actually make art. That is uh, one fine teacher that you had there. Uh, pretty lucky. Yeah, to get no, no complaints there. <laughs> uh, you and, and Christy formed uh, the Ottoman Collective. Can you tell us a bit about that uh, and how it's evolved? Yeah, so the Ottoman Collective was created as an art collective just to kind of make art and to use it as a platform to help us uh, fundraise and get things mobilized for Nimki Ajbekong. And so it was a really fun uh, start. It was full of doing really cool projects, like working with paints and dyes and all sorts of cool stuff. And it was amazing. It was a, just an incredible collective of artists that, that really believed we all had the same values. We still do. And so it was really a good launching pad for, for us to move into Nimki Ajbakam. And we're going to talk about Nimki Khan. We just have to step aside for a quick commercial break. And then we'll be back here, uh, continue the conversation with Isaac Murdoch here on Face to Face. Stick around. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is storyteller, artist Isaac Murdoch. And before the break, we were talking about Ottoman Collective, but uh, part of that work is, is as you said, Nimki Ajbakan. Uh, can you tell us about that camp and the objectives of it? Nimki Ajbakan is, it means Thunder Mountain. And I remember years and years ago, the old people always talked about a place where we could celebrate and nourish and feast our language a place where we can do our cultural practices, a place that where we can be out of society, in a sense, and rekindle who we are as, as a people. And so, of course, you know, like this is in the spirit of, of Small Boy, you know, Chief Small Boy. This is in the spirit of like Peter Ochis and Sam Moves Camp and Dennis Thorne and Joe P. Cardinal and all these great mentors in my life when I was young and my own grandparents. And so they always said it's important that we go back and we pick up what was lost and we move forward with it. And so Nimki Ajbakong is an extension of what, of what they were doing. And so it's, it's, it's not anything new. This has always been there. And so we're just kind of following what was left behind and carrying it forward. So people who come to uh, really this village, uh, what, what do you do there? What, uh, what's the available there? Well, they'll come driving in, um, they're going to see the big wigwam, and they're going to come find one of us. And what they're going to find is there's several houses there where, where people live. And there's also a, 
uh, cook shack. There's a, which is, I think I'm going to turn that into a, a living house, I think. Um, but we also have our community arts center, which took us, you know, quite a few years to, to be able to accomplish. But it's a beautiful space. We have like a museum gallery. There's a spot where it's specifically for language. There's a spot specifically for art. And it's the most beautiful building inside. So we got like really cool stuff in there. And it works. Like we were finding that we we just doing stuff in there all the time. Like this winter I was making beaver mitts and uh, like beaver hats, you know, just sewing them up in there like mad. Mm -hmm. um, it just it, it just creates a good energy. There's just good energy there. When you go there it's just people just don't want to leave. Who who can come there? Who who gets to participate? Um, I mean it's a lot of local people, mm -hmm. you know. But some of us might have friends that might come from far away, you know, and come stick around for a while. There's lots of visitors, you know. Um, we have a safe camp, you know, so it's, it's not like everybody can just go there and hang out because, you know, we want it to be safe. And so uh, it's, it's usually community members, people that we know, um, friends of ours. Um, but more importantly, the programming that we have that goes on there, the, the young people just grasp onto it. Like the young people at Nimki Ajbakong are doing moose hides. They're like, they're brain tanning stuff. Like they're they're rock and roll all the time. It's good. So you feel that it's uh, it's been a success now that it, uh, things are up and running. Hundred thousand million percent success. Yeah, hundred million thousand percent. Well, speaking of numbers, I mean, how do you keep it operating? Um, I think that, you know, like our blood, sweat, and tears went into that place. Like literally, you know. And so it was uh, a challenge to be able to get the infrastructure in place. Mm -hmm. And now we're at the point where it's like, okay, this place needs to kind of be self-sustaining. And so it's, it's happening, it's working, you know, but it's, it's slow, it's slow. We want to be 100% sustainable. We have gardens there, you know, so there's lots of gardening, there's lots of, uh, you know, harvesting, that sort of stuff. That keep that keeps the bills down. Yeah. Do do other people? You know, could this model be used in other places? Do you have people that? Uh... I mean, I hope it does. I mean, my dream is that there, there's going to be a thousand Nimki Ajbakongs all across the lands. You know, because as an indigenous species of our environment, we need to go back home. It's not natural to be contained on the reserves, and then just you know, like there is a plan. You know, in 1867, when Canada became a country, they started to develop what was called the Indian Act, which was to get all of the people off the lands, contained onto the reserves, so that a free-for-all in resource extraction could happen. And they did that. And the free-for-all in resource extraction went on for decades. And there was an ecological collapse as a result. But there was also a loss of language, a loss of culture, a loss of history, a loss of you know, all sorts, even burial sites have disappeared right. in time. There was a complete erasure that took, that took place. And it was, that erasure happened in the education system, it happened in the justice system. I mean, there was just no identity of who we were, even in the towns and cities. You know, like Elliott Lake, where I come from, that's Mujno Gaming is what it's called. But in the website, in the, the promotion of the town, there's nothing about us. But that's where we lived. Right. And so I felt it was so important to, to try and bring that fire and back and burn it bright as we can, you know, so that we can be a, a part of the ecological solution that's needed. We're not the Indian problem. A free indigenous people are not a problem. We are part of the solution of climate change. We, we hear about these hundreds of millions of dollars that the government says it's uh, providing for the revitalization of language and culture, things that you're doing there. Do you think that this is the, this type of camp, this is where the government should be putting their money or should they just be staying right out of it? I mean, I'm really proud to say that we've never took government money to build Nimki Ajbakong, mm -hmm. you know. But it wouldn't hurt my feelings if they threw <laughs> some freaking dollars our way for, for a language program. Right. Um, I think that... You know, there is a bit of a, a gap because a lot of the Bush Indians like myself who don't have an education, I can't really get access to funding because I don't know how to write anything down. 
How am I going to get that money? You know, so there's a really big gap, and it's the lots of times it's scholars or it's people that that are in those positions of knowing how to really write stuff down on the papers. They get all the money, yeah. But the Bush Indians that are doing stuff, <clears throat> they don't get anything. You know, so oftentimes we have to just pay out of pocket, yeah. Or you know, sell bake, bake sales and you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But that needs to change. <clears throat> So everybody that's watching, we need to make sure that the Bush Indians get the money too. If you know how to write grants, <laughs> reach out and, and help Isaac get some of that funding that we hear about all the time. Uh, language is such a big thing for you um, and a lot of the work that you do. Can you tell us a bit about the, your passion for helping others regain and retain that language? My grandparents uh, were very, very fluent in the language. And they were such a big impact on my life. And they always said that Whatever you do, include language with it. So when I write a book, it's also in the language. I'm doing an animation right now, it's going to be in the language. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of the projects that I do, I include the language in it. And I also tell the, the people that I'm involved with, like, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, or I'm, or I'm out. I can't be a, a part of this if there's not language attached to it. Because, you know, language is the, it's the foundation of our nationhood. It's who we are. It's, it, it carries so much ecological knowledge. And I think that language is it's magical because it comes from the earth. And during a time of massive you know, climate hikes, the language holds the ancient code on how to live here on this earth without driving it into an ecological deficit like what we've been doing. So language is not just cool. It's also, it's also a very important part of, of change. It's, it carries a value to it, like a carbon value, believe it or not. It's, it's amazing. Language can actually help save this planet. Uh, awesome stuff, Isaac. We're going to talk about uh, some of the ways that you utilize language to, ha to help others, too. We just got to step aside for one more quick break, and then we'll continue the conversation here with Isaac Murdoch on Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. We're thrilled this week to have Isaac Murdoch with us. Unfortunately, our time's going so quick, but we're talking about language revitalization uh, before the break. And you have two books in an Ojibwe history series. Uh, can you tell us about those books and what you hope the readers get out of those? Well, the books are, are Atsukanan, like sacred stories from my lands. And I really wanted to, like, to get them out there because I'm hoping that in 150 years, you know, some nerdy kid's going to come along and find these, these books. They're going to be like, what? Wow, I found this book. It's like an Ojibwe in English and it's like really cool and it's, it's got all these place names and all these this cool stuff. Like it really is for the future generations that I write these books. And I hope that they'll inspire and help rejuvenate the language in the future when it's really needed. Uh, before the show, when we were uh, having some technical difficulties, we were just talking about, you know, how you you quit your job to become a storyteller and didn't even know that that was, like, a thing. That storytelling yeah, is yeah, also yeah. a job. Can you just talk about um, the importance of being a storyteller to yourself? Well, I get asked, like, all the time to go around and tell stories, you know. So every day I get requests, you know, can you come here and you, can you come there and blah, 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 do stories. When I was younger, I was so quiet. Like, if I was on here, like, 15 years ago, my face would be as red as an apple, mm. and I wouldn't say nothing. You know, but being a storyteller, I guess it was just inside of me. And one day I thought, you know what? You're going to quit your job, and you're going to become a storyteller. And I didn't even think that there was, like, a... Like, it's not like you apply for it, right? Yeah, I haven't seen too many of those you know? postings. Um, but so I started telling stories. Next thing you know, I'm, like, at weddings and dances and like funerals even. But then I started to go Winnipeg, you know, Toronto, Edmonton, you know, Minnesota. I started to travel around and it actually became a real thing. You know, so I started telling stories, mm -hmm. like stories of my people. And uh, it's, it's taken me on this beautiful journey all over Turtle Island. It's been incredible. 
And we're all blessed because of that. Um, you know, speaking of telling stories uh, and coming out of your shell, I guess, uh, you also are a recording musician, uh, recorded uh, or released your first album with uh, with Matt Epp in, in 2021, you released another album last year. Uh, can you talk about your music and what that means to you? Yeah, I think music is a really good way to express. It's a way to say things, uh, you know, to a large audience. And to get feelings across. I want people to feel the music and to feel the whatever message we're trying to get across. We want them to feel something about it. I think that society is always striving to feel something because when you get out there in the real world, you know, it's a very, very, everybody's in silos. But music and art and stories have a way to bring people together and to share something in common. And I think that's why I do the music. What are the messages that you, you hope to get out with that music? Like, no pipelines, like, be good to the environment, you know, be good to your mom and dad. Um, you know, like, there's just a whole bunch of good messages. Um, there's one song that's about aliens. <laughs> you know, they pick me up and they take me to space and, you know, I get inspired to write the song that, that's on the album. It's, uh, and uh, the alien just wants to blow us up because we're just, like, destroying ourselves anyway, you know. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a dark song, but I, I can do dark. I can do dark. Well, it's great stuff. I was listening to it this morning. You can find Isaac's music on Spotify, Apple Music, uh, streaming services. Uh, uh, before we go, we also did want to talk about that uh, Ojibwe language resource that you're, you're working oh. on, the animation. Uh, can you tell us about that? So we're doing an animation. It's a story, and it's all in the language. It's a bit of a top secret. But we're, we've got great animators from Japan that are going to be that are working on it. Um, shout out to Toon Boom, shout out to the Cameron family, to the Canadian Arts Council for helping this happen. It's a really exciting project. But before we actually really go, I wanted to give you something. Hmm? And this here, well, it's like the same thing that's on my shirt. Right. Right. We want to give you this because. The work that you do is also revolutionary, and you're also creating change by bringing voices forward. And it's incredible work that you do, and I just wanted to give you this as a token of appreciation for all of the, the, the good things you do. This is a revolutionary face-to-face -face APTN thing that you're doing. So it's only fair that you have this. So well, that's, that you. Uh, you almost uh, brought a tear to my eye there, <laughs> Isaac. Uh, uh, what we're happy to, uh, I'm super happy to accept this, but also very happy to, uh, you know, be able to promote voices uh, like yourself. And uh, like I said, for a long time, we wanted to have you on the show. Uh, it has not been a disappointment. The only disappointment is that we, we're out of time for the show. But, we're out of time. Uh, That's good. Uh, so happy to have uh, had you here and uh, wish you all the best in all the work that you keep doing. Thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for this week's show. But while you're over on, uh, you know, Apple Music or Spotify uh, listening to Isaac's music, you can also download this show as a podcast. This episode and all of our previous episodes are also available as podcasts. And if you missed any shows, you can find those over on our website, aptnnews.ca. Thanks so much for being with us this week. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks to Isaac. We'll see you back here next week.